Hello and welcome to the Island Podcast. I'm your typical host, Ivan Grigorishin, and my guest today is Josh Pruneau from the LA Current. Josh, hello and thank you so much for making it to this podcast. Yeah, hey, what's up? Thank you for having me. Of course. Josh, sort of to start us off, um, tell us a little bit, how are you and how was your training being post Budapest? Doing good, doing good, yeah. Um, Training has been really good. I've felt great about the last like month or so. Um, this, this winter, I know, I know Yuri would be happy to hear this. Um, I definitely got back to my roots a little bit, did a lot of 400 IM type training, just really long, elevated, sustained, high intensity work. Um, I mean, we were hitting like 8K, 9K a workout um, on our single days on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so yeah, we, we've been getting after it. And I think that kind of training is, is really good for me just because it forces me to, um, just have that baseline swimming, that like long flowing, efficient stroke. Um, I think that's really what sets up my success in the water rather than just kind of jumping on it, rushing things, trying to reach really far and grab a ton of water early. Um, is, is not my style of swimming. Like it works for, for big, strong guys who swim the 50, I think. Um, but for me, I need to set a baseline of just being long and efficient and then put a little bit more muscle and a little bit more force into that stroke. Um, and that's how I can rev up for like the last half of a 200 or maybe even a hundred meter race. Mm-hmm. So no more power towers for Josh on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh man, not in a while, <laughs> not in okay. a while. We've swapped that out for, for many 200s. I am long course descent. <laughs> that sounds fun. Um, oh, yeah. Josh, Talking about that sort of change in the dynamics of your workouts in the water, have your gym workouts changed also? Have you been focusing more on sort of mini reps and sort of technique, or is it still, you still sort of do one rep snatches sometimes and stuff like that? Uh, I mean, it's always been pretty diversified. Um, I mean, you, you know, just as well from, from your time at Berkeley, um, they like to mix it up in there. Um, I think like when the pandemic started, it was definitely like super change. I mean, I was just like running hills and stairs a ton. And I've stayed with that a little bit just for a little extra cardio. Um, some of the, some of the guys bike for extra cardio, like on the stationary bike, but I've got a bunch of hills near my house. So I just run up and down. them. Um, but I mean, again, for a guy like me, I think all that stuff is so secondary to, to what we do in the water. Um, I don't know if this is a controversial take or anything, but I don't really think that like pure just force output is that like important for swimming, right? Like I think there are very few sports where you actually need to be weight room strong for success, like American football, wrestling, stuff like that, obviously. Um, But for swimming, I really think it's like, it's all movement patterns. It's it's explosiveness. It's like being able to be connected with your body. Um, So that's like definitely for a guy like me that's more mid distance focused, um, just like becoming a better overall athlete in the gym that's the goal. Not necessarily being able to put up like a 500 pound back squat. I don't think that matters too much. You know, it's very interesting to hear that from you. And, um, you know, a couple of, a couple of months ago, I was chatting to a bunch of Tokyo Falking athletes. And what I found out was, um, close to like 80% of the team has never lifted weights whatsoever. And yeah. I'm, like, I've always been very curious about that. I know, right? It's so strange. And Uriyasuke Iri said he, he hasn't lifted anything for over a decade. And he's just yeah, getting back into it. There's a lot of it. core stuff that those guys do, right? The, their cores are super strong. Yeah, they do some, they do some dry length strength and conditioning. Um, just, just, just something like we would do before Tuesdays and Thursdays. They would get mm-hmm. together before a um, water workout and hit the abs, hit uh, stretch out a little bit, and then hit the water. But what, he did, what they did say to me, is that the majority of their power work comes from the water. They'll do a lot of resistance. They'll do a lot of sprinting, but nothing outside of the water. It's interesting. Maybe something, something you could have a look at, and maybe that could benefit you. Yeah, I love that. Um, if, yeah, I mean, if my career extends, um, I'd love to play around with that. Just, um, yeah, I think that's a super interesting way to train. And obviously, I mean, look at those guys. Like, it's, it's successful. It works. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would love to switch it up. I think it's super interesting that there are so many different ways to, to reach that top level in our sport. 
Agreed. Yeah, and the way they move in the water is just unparalleled. Their technique, their feel for the water is just amazing. Maybe, maybe thanks to that partially. But talking about that, um, talking about actually Tokyo 2021, Josh, um, what stage of preparation are you in for Tokyo 2021? Um, do you have still a long sort of and hard training routine before you start to ease up? Are you going to ease up a little earlier? Um, trials for you guys are pretty late, so probably you still have another couple of months of solid work, right? Yeah, we've for sure got some more months of solid work. Trial starts June 13th, um, and it's still March. So, yeah, we're still hitting it pretty hard. Um, we're definitely starting to shift a little bit from that really, like, sustained high intensity phase where it was high volume and mid to high intensity. Um, the volume's coming down ever so slightly and the intensity is coming up. We're definitely not at the taper stage where intensity is way up and volume's way down. Um, but definitely starting to make that transition. Right. Um, so we're seeing, um, I wouldn't say it's in like what you would traditionally call the like quality phase yet, but we're, like slowly ramping down and getting to that point. Makes sense. Josh, you mentioned you're throwing in some 400 individual mentally practice in your, in your routine. Um, what about your, your plans for, for actual events for Tokyo 2021? Are you going to solely focus on 200 breaststroke or are you going to also throw in 100 breast, 200 IM, 400 IM? What are the plans? Dog, who knows? Um, Fortunately, I'm, I've been versatile enough in the past to have qualified for a bunch of events. Um, so I have the freedom to just enter them all and see what feels good, right? Um, like, obviously, I'm going to focus mainly on the 200 breaststroke. Um, that is the bread and butter long course. That's been, like, where my goals have been focused for, for the past five or six or seven years of my career. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to go to practice every day and only focus on one thing, Right. Like I'm, I'm trying to become a better overall athlete. Um, and if it turns out that this year is the year that I finally figure out how to swim long course backstroke, then, then like, yeah, maybe, maybe I reverse course and I go back to that four I am on day one. Um, I'd have to be feeling really, really confident in the 200 I am in order to swim that because that overlaps with the 200 breaststroke. Um, it would go like prelims, 200 breast, semis, 200 breast at trials. Then the next day I'd have prelims 200 IM and then the finals of 200 breast and the semis of 200 IM. So that is, that is a tough call to make. Um, a bunch of us who, who were contending for the two breasts last time ended up scratching that two IM to just focus on that two breast final, um, which is probably the move. But again, like I'm a versatile guy. I'm trying to get better a lot of, at a lot of things. Um, I think a lot of things are clicking right now. So yeah, we'll, we'll see. Do you, what do you feel like going to be more competitive to I am or two breast for us trials? Uh, I don't think there's really an event there. That's not competitive. It's, it's stacked. There's, there's no event in which it is easy to make the U S Olympic team. Um, I mean, the fields in both those events are absolutely stacked and it's got, it's gotten nothing but more competitive um, as we've gotten closer to the trials and as, as trials got postponed even like more more newcomers come on the scene and are going to be challenging for that second first and second spot so yeah man it's uh it's it's a battle wherever you look Makes sense and josh we wish you best of luck coming into trials go bears yeah go bears indeed thank you what about the actual olympics are you confident that they're going to take place yeah i don't feel like they're going to cancel them um I mean, who knows, like news could come out, like, as I'm talking right now, that um, the Japanese government cancels him. But I, I don't think it'll happen. I think they'll still go off. Um, they, there will probably be something going on with the spectators, right? Like, either only local spectators, or um, no spectators at all. I don't know. I don't know if you saw for the torch relay. Um, they're saying like, no, like no yelling, no cheering for the torch relay, <laughs> which is already like, um, very weird. It's going to be a weird Olympics, right? Like there's no, there's no getting around that. But I think, um, it, you know, honestly, there's, there's like too much money to be made from, from TV deals and stuff.
for them to want to cancel it. That's that's what I think at least. Yeah, but on on the other hand, if if you have too many COVID cases, this could be the end of the Olympics. So it could be a disaster. But on, I mean, on the other other hand, if you cancel it, um, and you right. you risk then having a like a larger gap between games. And that, that could also be the end of the Olympics, right? So, and that would be I, devastating I for swimming, right? Eight years without Olympic swimming, it would be way too much. Probably would not be good. Probably would not, yeah. I mean, for, for any Olympic sport, really. Um, yeah, which is why it kind of sucks that there's one thing every four years that's on the world stage. So Maybe soccer and fans, basketball. Uh, stay strong. Wouldn't suffer as much, right? <laughs> Well, I don't consider those Olympic sports, right? Yeah, like the enough. Olympics for those are smaller than their other leagues. Like, come on, you're going to watch Champions League. You're not going to watch the Olympic soccer. Yeah, they also have these weird limitations, right? You can only participate if you're younger than 21. You're, you're not yeah, a professional. Yeah, soccer. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like in boxing, right? There, there, there's certain right. limitations, yeah. not as strict, though. Yeah. Anyway, Josh, um, let's take a... Um, throwback to, to the ISL season. Um, how would you analyze the performance of LA Current in general in um, ISL season 2020? For the team overall, I think we did great. Um, I think, you know, I didn't read a whole lot of like analysts' expectations for our team, but I think the general consensus was that we'd be like battling for a spot in the final. Um, I think a lot of people probably had us on the outside looking in. Um, I mean, we cruised into that sucker. We, we got in there, like, strong, right? Um, we, we handled the regular season. We handled the semi. Uh, we had some tough meets in, in that regular season against some strong teams. Um, I mean, Tom was just a horse for us, like, taking care of the, the jackpot. Um, Murph was a beast in skins. Um, Anastasia, like, took off in the breaststroke skins, um, she she exploded in the IMs this year. She was great for us. Um, B's B's a tank in the sprint events as always. Like, yeah, I think I think we performed well. Um, I mean, we were a great team. I I loved hanging out with those people, um, and we were always like at the the table tennis center in the hotel, um, doing doing workouts with people I don't normally get to to work out with. It's awesome. Um, yeah, man, I think we handled the season well, and. Yeah, we would have liked to get better than fourth in the final, but I mean, hey, we were on the outside looking in, and we made it in there. Absolutely, and I thought you guys did amazing, um, especially especially um, looking at some of the individual swims. Oh, it was it was outstanding. Just having a look at Murr's fifty eight points from a single skins race, that was. I mean, I was sure it would have, it, it was going to get beaten when it happened. Just thinking, there's so much more to go off the season. But looking back at it now, I'm not sure if that's going to get beaten anytime soon. 58 points. Holy yeah, that one was nuts. Josh, what about your own performance in ISL season 2020? Um, are you happy with it? And did Dave have any input for you postseason? Uh, no, I was not happy with it. I thought I horribly underperformed. Um, yeah, so I... <laughs> maybe this will be a longer answer than you need. Um, I, I don't think I'm a very talented athlete in the sense that if you take me out of the water for like a week um, and then you put me back in and say, Hey, swim fast. I have no idea what's going on. Right. I do not have very good natural feel. I've got to be in there every day performing correct habits in order to maintain feel. Right. There's a good analogy. Um, like let's say you get dropped off by a taxi cab. You're in a big city, right. And someone hands you a map of Chicago. So you're, you're using this map trying to get around the city. Um, the problem is you're in Detroit. Okay. So if you use this map to try and get around, you're going to get lost. If you say, all right, I'm going to try harder. I'm going to go faster. Like you're only going to succeed in getting to the wrong place twice as fast. Um, I think that's basically what I was doing throughout the season was using the wrong map, right? Like I looking at video that swims, like it just looks mechanical forced, like, moving in kind of straight line patterns rather than like being able to, to like flow into it and use the body's big, strong muscle groups to apply force. Um, I wasn't using rotation very well. Um, 
a lot of a lot of things were going wrong. I think I was just like thinking about it the wrong way, and because there were so many competitions back to back, um, I. I kind of looked at it the wrong way and I was like, well, it's too big of a risk if I try to make like a big um, systematic change right now. So I just got to like do everything harder. Right. And that, that didn't work. I was pretty stagnant for the whole year. I was just putting up mediocre times. I mean, you know, a couple of percentage points off my best, but not really where I want to be. Um, it was good to kind of come off that season, get a little reset um, and go, all right, I need to like start thinking about this sport a different way. Right. And, um, I mean, even throughout the ISL season, like I really tried to do that, you know, I write down technique notes a lot. I look over race video and practice video a lot. Um, but I just, I didn't do a good job of it. Um, I think the reason why I'm hitting good times in training right now is because I'm doing a better job of that. Um, I think for me, it's all about using the correct map. Josh, um, the roadmap analogy is probably one of the best analogies I've ever heard. That that that, that explains fast swimming to to a novice quite quite well. Um, I, I have quite the same feeling regarding regarding races. But um, Josh, if you were to take a step back, I mean, you say you're not very happy with the season, but knowing you and hearing what you said to me right now, it seems like you did everything in your power to make the season as good as you could. Um, it seems like COVID was the reason reason you underperformed for yourself, in your opinion. But taking a little step back, would, if you could, would you change absolutely anything to make the season better? Um, yeah, I think that change would have to have come um, sort of before the season. Um, but no, I don't think I would change anything. I mean, being there with that group of people was was great. I mean, especially at that point in the pandemic when we just been isolated and locked up for so long um yeah no i'd 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 go back in a heartbeat and do that again with those guys um that was awesome thanks josh josh you are a big technician when it comes to the world of swimming and breaststroke in particular you're probably aware of the situation that took place during isl bubble between mel marshall and um Ilya shimanovich mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was wondering what is your take on it and what do you think about the situation in general? Do you feel like the breaststroke rules need to sort of take a change a little bit so that ambiguity disappears? It's really hard if you don't allow the officials to DQ people with the underwater video. Um, but if you do allow that, then that opens up a whole nother can of worms. So it's, it's very hard to say. W with the specific rule in question, the like dolphin kicking into turns or finishes. I mean, that has existed in short course meters, breaststroke swimming for over a decade, for sure. Like that's been around a long time. And there is, there is a legal way to do this where you just kind of use the pressure from your upper body to lunge into the wall without having to like bring your knees up for the breaststroke kick, but your legs stay flat when you do this. There's not like a, a pop down with the knees and ankles, right? it becomes illegal when you are like using the legs to like snap your ankles down into that kick. Um, but again, there's a really fine line between those two things that illegal and not illegal. And it's near impossible to see um, from the surface of the water, especially if you're a ref, like you're standing there and you got to look down to make sure the person is touching the wall with two hands at the same time. You can't also be looking at their feet to see whether or not their legs are flat or whether they're, they're snapping their ankles down into a dolphin kick. You just can't do it. Um, so, yeah, it kind of becomes a question of, like, what is, what is de facto legal, which I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I try not to cheat in breaststroke, but I'm, I'm not going to take up a, a very strong position on this matter. Fair enough. Um, sort of bouncing off of that, and you already mentioned it a little bit, out of pure interest, what do you think regarding the rule for um, butterfly and breaststroke that you must touch with both hands simultaneously? Because I've heard a lot of contro controversy regarding this rule. And a lot of people say that maybe the golden way to do it would be to have both hands touch at some point during your turn, but it doesn't have to be simultaneous. Oh, interesting. Um, hmm. I've never heard this. That is an interesting thought, though. I don't really know how much faster it would be on a flat wall anyway. Um, 
if you had one of those gutter walls and you could reach out with one hand and grab and pull yourself in, then that'd be like slightly faster, I guess. But I don't know. I mean, I guess it'd be interesting. Definitely be easier to, uh, to check that on, on like the overhead turn cameras, you know, but in yeah, my I don't opinion, know. I mean, this, this rule is too strict anyway. Why, why would you want to the, the, the hands to touch simultaneously? Maybe for the finish. Finish for sure. Yeah. No, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, I mean, the sport's always progressing. You've, we've seen, we've seen rule changes over the years. Maybe, maybe that's the next one. Who knows? I don't know when that next meeting is. I think, I think this year. We'll see. Thank you, Josh. Josh, um, what is your pre-race mental preparation? And if you have any, and what is your pre-race mental state? Sure. Um, good question. Um, I'd say as far as mental prep, I, I kind of subscribe to the, the Ryan Murphy theory. Uh, if you don't want to like get too high or too low, you kind of want to be in the middle somewhere. Um, yeah, you should, you should be like calm, but ready. Right. I think, um, I forget who had this interview. Um, but they, they asked some like famous us Olympian, like, Hey, what's going through your mind when you're on the blocks? And their response was, well, like, well, if you, if you did your prep, right, nothing, like absolutely nothing. Um, and that's kind of where I want to be. Right. Like I want to, um, I want to have enough trust in my preparation that I'm not like freaking out on the starting blocks thinking, okay, I got to like streamline the dolphin kick really hard. You know, like I'm, I'm trusting the process. I'm just like, I'm aware of the situation. I know what's going on. I know what I need to, to do to accomplish my goals. Um, as far as mental state heading in, um, kind of depends on the environment, right? If it's, um, if it's going to be like a really intense ready room where people aren't going to talk, um, I'll put the headphones on, listen to some punk rock and get ready. Um, but if it's like a relaxed environment, then, then yeah, I'll like hang out, chat with people, just be relaxed. Makes sense. Man, I thought the Ryan Murphy, the Ryan Murphy system was to just blast Sandstorm in the locker <laughs> room. And <laughs> that, that was the mental maybe, preparation. Maybe that's more workout. I don't know. Okay. Um, makes sense, Josh. Um, what, about, what about the anxiety Do, do, do you have a way of battling that anxiety pre-meet if, you, if you've developed it, if, if it happened to you? I mean, if there's a good way to do this, um, DM me and let me know because I haven't found one yet. Um, no, dude, like if you're at a stressful meet, I mean, US Olympic trials is the most stressful meet I've ever been to in my life. That is terrifying, man. Like <laughs> you get up on the blocks and it's like, okay, I, I win this race. I have a career. I lose I don't, um, like I have to find a job. I, I don't get to do this anymore. You know, like that's, that's real. And there's no, there's no way to like fool yourself into thinking that, Oh, it's just another race. It's just another meet when the stakes are that high. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really just about like being more focused on the process than the outcome, which is really, really hard in, in a situation like that. Um, I'd say it's more like being focused enough on the process that anxiety about the outcome is not going to um, decrease your level of performance. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, something, something Dave Durden mentioned to us, I remember a couple of years ago, is the best meets happen and the best races happen is when you don't care as much and when you have a lot of things other than this going on in your life. Would you agree totally. to this? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, for the, for the past couple of months, I think um, one of the reasons my training has been so good is because I've been doing other stuff at home, right? I've got some like coding projects that I've tried to work on. I've been trying to read and learn things a lot. Um, so when I'm not at the pool, I'm not thinking about being at the pool as much, right? I'm not just like obsessing over it, like trying to like watch GoPro video from that day and overanalyze it. Uh, and get anxious. Right. Um, and yeah, there, there's definitely something to be said for like, just kind of getting loose, letting go. Um, and just like letting the performance come to you rather than trying to force it. Thank you. Josh, what about your pre-meat diet? Do you have a specific meal plan you follow before meat? Not really. It's just more general with, um, 
what you call macros, I guess. I mean, I eat a lot of oatmeal at meats. Um, just bring those instant packets with me. That's my, my pre-final snack. Um, but no, I'm not super strict with anything. Um, I just think that in general, like if I'm training a ton, that's more calories. Um, if you're tapering, that's more vegetables, less carbs. Um, and then you got to fuel yourself properly at meats. So making sure you're getting enough protein and carbs, um, while still getting nutrients. Makes sense. What about your body weight? Does it fluctuate a lot during the season or do you still relatively, relatively stable? It really does not. I'm pretty sure I've been in the same like eight pound range since 2015. Oh, wow. Thank you. Josh, a traditional place for Cal men's swimming team is the trip to OTC in Colorado, which is approximately yes, 800 sir. meters or 5,900 feet above sea level. What value do you see in training in the altitude and what are the dangers? Yeah, great question. Um, I think there's a lot of value in training at altitude. Um, not only for the the obvious physiological benefits of like you're, you're increasing your oxygen efficiency, right? You're training at an oxygen deficit there compared to where you are at sea level. Um, so like your, your red blood cell count is going to go up once you go back down to sea level. That's good, obviously, but also just for like, it, it's mental toughness, right? There's, um, it, it's harder to work out there. Right. And you've got to deal with that. You've got to, you've got to get through those workouts, like do it with your teammates um, there's, yeah, I mean, that's always, I think, like a turning point in the season for us, at least for the college team. Um, just like the, the camaraderie that, that forms there is something really special. Um, but yeah, I think that's an important, that's been an important place for us. Um, we haven't been able to go this year yet. I'm hoping we get one trip before trials, but, um, yeah, man, there's just something pure about being up in the mountains and having, having the next workout really like be your only worry. Makes sense. Do you think that there is a significant danger in overtraining in the altitude or is that sort of a, yes, it exists, but no more dangerous than, than at sea level. Um, maybe it's a bit more dangerous at altitude just because of the risk of like getting sick up there. I think if you try to do too much too quickly, um, you can definitely kind of, dig yourself a hole that's pretty tough to get out of um as far as i remember like typically when we go there we'll start off with um i think seven workouts in a row so three doubles and then a morning single um and those three doubles are not very intense um we're not doing anything incredibly challenging but they are pretty long um and a lot of them will involve breath control work so it's really just like slowly ramping up getting your body used to it um, and after that we can hit it hard, but if we just went in our day one and we're doing these like crazy nine kilometer four IM workouts, I think, you know, we'd, we'd be hurting pretty bad. And I don't think we would get as much like productivity out of those trips. Makes sense. Thank you, Josh. Josh, I know that you're a big fan of hikes. Could you oh, speak yeah. a little bit about the sort of positives you get from hikes for your swimming career in terms of mental positives and physical positives sure yeah um well i mean altitude is beneficial as we discussed um on a lot of the like mountaineering trips i've done we've we've basically just lived and camped above twelve thousand feet um you can let me know how many meters that is it's like 3500 i'm assuming um yes. yeah about 3500 meters um we've been up there for like a week right just going up, down, up, down, going over these mountain passes uh, in the high Sierra. So, I mean, that's obviously good for your system, right? I mean, I've come off one of those trips uh, and the next day I just went to the pool and I was like, I bet I could do a hundred pull long course, no breath right now. And I did it. <laughs> um, you're just insanely oxygen efficient after that. And it's awesome. Um, as far as uh, mental benefits. Yeah. I think there's, there's definitely similarities there. Um, like if you're, if you're in the mountains and you're doing some sort of challenging technical route that you've never done before, you've just read a little bit about it. Um, yeah. I mean, you're relying on the decision-making of, of yourself and the people you're that you're there with. Right. Um, you got to rely on your friends to help you a little bit. Um, there's definitely a mental toughness aspect. I mean, getting up mountains is not easy. Swimming is also not. Um, there's, 
yeah, there's definitely a, a point in, in workouts where you got to push through just staring at this monotonous black line, just pushing through grinding out some effort. Uh, mountain climbing is much the same. Um, yeah, I wouldn't like, <laughs> I, I wouldn't hike as my primary method of training, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think it's useless either. There's definitely some, some parallels to be drawn. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Josh, how did you get into swimming? Um, as a baby, <laughs> I, I did those baby swim lessons, uh, with my parents. I, I did swim lessons all through my childhood and, um, at my local pool when I was like six, I think I reached the max level of swim lessons that they had. And they said, Hey, if you want to keep swimming, join this local team. Uh, so I did, I was doing those like 25 yard races, just diving off the side of the pool, having a great time. Um, and I, I just loved it. Um, I was playing a lot of sports as a kid. I played baseball, I ran cross country, I played soccer, um, tried to sign up for flag football, but there weren't enough kids in my, <laughs> on, the, on the Air Force base that I lived at that signed up. Um, there would have been like one and a half teams. Um, but yeah, when I was like 13, um, I kind of had to sit down and say, all right, which one of these sports am I actually going to keep doing? Because it was going to be too much of a time commitment. Um, the other ones, I was just kind of messing around, having fun, but swimming, I actually had some long-term goals that I wanted to hit. So I stuck with it. Got it. Makes sense. Wow. Um, you know, as some, it's usually this, this, this story about a older sibling getting into swimming or, or, or the parent being, being an excellent swimmer or the parents having a, a fear of the, the kid drowning and putting, putting the kid into swimming. But for you, it seems like everything just happened naturally. It was just lifelong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean, growing up in Southern California definitely helped. Um, just being around water, but, but yeah, I mean, I've literally been doing this my entire life. Thank you, Josh. Josh, what motivates you to swim? Is it sort of the athlete's lifestyle? Is it the thrill of competition? Is it desire, the desire to win? Is it just the love for swimming as an activity or is it something else? There's definitely two, there's, there's something to just like the activity of swimming. And this would not be the case if I lived in a cold place in the world. All right. This is like purely a swimming outdoors thing. Um, it was, it was just about freezing this morning at practice in Berkeley. So, I mean, hopefully I, this, this changes soon, but I mean, there's nothing like swimming outdoors in California in the summer. It's great. Um, the, the main reason that I'm still around is, is self-improvement, right? Um, swimming is a puzzle that you got to figure out. And sometimes it's really hard and frustrating and sometimes it's clicking and you feel like you can do anything. Um, I know that I haven't hit my best performances yet. I don't even think I'm close. Right. Um, like I'm, I'm better than 207.17. I just have to find that performance and actually put it together. Right. The, the search for that is what's driving me. Not, I don't really think it's like the thrill of competition because like I said, going to trials is hella scary. Um, I don't think it's the, the desire to win even because if, if Trufkoff goes like 204 um, and, I, and I bust out a best time and go like 206, I'm going to be really happy with that for myself, right? Like there's nothing I can do if Trufkoff's going to go 204, right? Um, I really think it's it, like, it's just like, one, one final really good, as close to perfection as I can get performance for myself. So just sort of continuing on that for you, swimming is really proving to yourself how good you can get as an individual and just, just, just seeing where that potential limit might be, even if you don't reach it. Do, do, am I getting this right? I think that's a good succinct way to put it. I mean, there's something really cool about um, like, searching for perfection or searching for being world-class at something. Right. And this is a timestamp thing for me, right? This is, this is probably like the last time in my life that I'm going to be this close to being number one in the world at something, right? Like in 2016, my world rank was one in 2018, my world rank was two. Um, I'm probably going to go into like data analytics or something after this. There is no way that I become the number one or number two data analyst in the world ever in my life. Like I'm going to be good at it, no doubt, but dude, there are people who are so damn good at data analytics and they know 
all the tricks in Python and SQL, um, I'm, I'm not going to get to the number one level, right? So yeah, there's obviously something really cool about being that close to the literal top of the world in this. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not ready to let that go yet. Makes sense. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a very rare treat pleasure opportunity to get to compete for being the number one in the world. I totally see where you're coming from. Um, yeah. But with, with that being said, um, Josh, I feel like you still have quite the career in swimming in front of you. You're, you're speaking like you're about to be done soon, but man, have a look at Nicolas Santos. This guy is pushing the best results, but it's pretty it. easy. Yeah, that guy's incredible. I mean, yeah, watching watching what he's done over the years, man, it's yeah, it's inspiring to see. I don't know, I don't know if I even want to swim that long. I think I'm ready for for a lifestyle change pretty soon here. But um, no, what he's done is is incredible. Now that I think about it, more than thirty years of breaststroke, sounds a little bit painful on the knees, almost. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> I think I would run into problems eventually. Makes sense. Thank you, Josh. Josh, um, we're about to pop into our fan questions um, part of this podcast. But before this, I just have one more question I would like to ask you. And this is, how important is the team aspect for you in your swimming motivation, in your swimming performance? Because the team, the team spirit and the team bond is so strong at Cal. Do you see yourself succeeding to the same extent or do you see yourself maybe one day training on yourself, not as part of such a team? Um, I can, no, I could not do this by myself. Um, yeah, the team aspect's huge. I mean, people do tend to think of swimming as an individual sport, but I mean, we, we've said it multiple times in this podcast, swimming is hard. Swimming training is very difficult. Um, and being able to, appreciate the process more if you do it with your friends if you do it with people that you care about um and if you're trying to help each other through the process every day is definitely something that should not be overlooked i think it helps a ton um and yeah i think it's i don't have the data on this but i think if you if you look at the world's top swimmers a lot of them are going to have these really good supportive teams i mean yes people have definitely succeeded on their own before um, but it takes, it takes a special kind of person with a lot of mental toughness and dedication to do that. Makes sense. Thank you, Josh. I would say sort of you're, you're right. If it comes more on the Western side of swimmers, but Eastern side of the, of the globe, there's a lot of individual athlete and coach duos that are incredible. Well, we did, successful. we did say mental toughness. <laughs> yeah, true. Was, uh, <laughs> a part of this. Um, Thank you, Josh. And with that being said, let's move into our fan questions. And to start things off, one of our fans wants to know, Josh, what is your sleep schedule? And do you suffer from insomnia pre-meet? Um, yeah, good question. I think if I, if I like, have too much cold brew before finals, uh, I can have trouble falling asleep sometimes. Um, sleep schedule is pretty normal for a swimmer. I mean, I try to... I mean, practice is early sometimes, but I try to get like between seven and nine hours a night. Like I want to keep that average as close to eight as I can. Uh, definitely catching up on weekends. But um, yeah, I think sleep can sometimes be an overlooked aspect of recovery. Um, like if, if you're foam rolling and you're sitting in your recovery Normatec boots um, and you're trying to do massage a lot, but you're not sleeping enough, um, I really think sleep is like maybe the most important aspect of recovery. Are you a napper? For sure. Yeah. You'd be hard pressed to find a swimmer who's not. Uh, I know a lot of swimmers who don't nap out of the sole reason that it's hard for them to fall asleep in the evening. If they nap. Sure. Yeah. 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 And again, yeah, this is going to depend on like the time of the season, the intensity of training. Um, yeah. At meets, sometimes I will not nap for that reason but in general yeah i'll take naps makes sense thank you josh good point josh um what is the difference in your opinion between a good swimmer and a great swimmer i don't know that there's one good answer to that like there's so many aspects of swimming that have to go right um to put together a great performance um 
I mean, that's an interesting question of, of defining, defining the metric for that. I'd say, um, like in general, what, what makes a great swimmer, like from a good swimmer, what, what separates them? Like what are the characteristics? Um, I mean, maybe one thing you could point to is, um, working smart and working hard. I think, um, almost any like top or almost top level swimmer is going to work hard, right? That's ingrained in you as a kid on a swim team. Like you show up, you got to put in the effort, right? But if everyone's putting in the effort, putting in a lot of effort, then that just becomes the bare minimum. So it's like, what are you doing on top of that? How, how are you like getting in touch with your own body, your own strengths and abilities how are you working on your own individual weaknesses on top of that? So you can get the best out of this sport for yourself. Um, I think that's, that's one of many, many differences you could point to. Got it. Thank you, Josh. Josh, um, one of our fans wants to know if you could be better at one off event, what would it be? 50 free. 50 free. That was an easy, that was easy. Should have put a bad into blitz. Okay. Makes sense. <laughs> Um, everyone wants to be a sprinter being a sprinter is fun being a sprinter is fun but i've heard so many answers from sprinters now to similar similar questions saying oh man i just wish i could swim the mile or like the four i am i don't know why but they, sprinters yeah they really... just want they just want the one distance practice a week they do to be easy <laughs> yeah true <laughs> that that makes sense now um josh one, another fan wants to know um what is the best part of the day for racing and for training in your perspective? Mm. Um, for racing, honestly, I, um, this will depend meet by meet, but man, like at, at NC2As or at, at like a summer national championships um, where I'm not racing on the first day of competition, like at NCs, you got just the relay on the first day, right? Um, at, at summer nationals for us, um, typically I think it's like the, the 200 fly on the first day. Um, and then I'll get in for the 200 breasts on the second day. Um, I kind of, I love that little waiting period where you're, you're watching your teammates kill it. Uh, you're just like itching to go for your shot. Um, you're, you're getting hyped up. You're getting into that team environment. Um, yeah, I love that. As, as far as training, um, I'd say, yeah, I mean, very, very similar, like being in the middle of a, of a tough set with your boys um, and pushing each other, getting through it, maybe talking a little bit of trash. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. It's a grind. But yeah, there's definitely some enjoyment in that, too. Thank you, Josh. And Josh, I know you've had some some Twitter wars yourself. What is your opinion on trash talking and swimming in general? Do you think there's a part, there's there's place for trash talking? Nah, I don't know. Maybe. Um <laughs> That was a, uh, I was young, young and dumb Josh there. Um, no, I think there's, there's definitely a place for it. I mean, in, in any sport, right. At the end of the day, this is, this is a spectacle, um, for, for people to watch and enjoy. Um, yeah, I think there's a difference in different sports. Like I think some people put on like a big show of talking trash to people. Um, and then in real life, they're, they're low key friends. Um, yeah, I don't know. As swimmers, we're like, we're pretty damn friendly to each other, right? I mean, we show up to ISL and there's people from like every country in the world there. And it seems like for the most part, like we're all pretty good friends. Like we know each other. We've seen each other. We're hanging out. Um, everyone likes each other. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Should, should our sport get less friendly? Hard to it's say. A, it's a good question. Um, I feel like there, there should be a part, a place for, for trash talk in, in the sport, especially because... Yes, people are very friendly towards each other, but I feel like there's another side of the coin. A lot of people aren't actually that friendly to each other. They just, the, swimming traditionally is a very respectful sport. You don't come out and talk trash about another swimmer. It just doesn't happen. Yeah, I do think that, yeah, you're right there. The tradition certainly plays into it. May, we'll see how it goes. Maybe, maybe we'll see more of it in the future. But Josh, yeah, we this might. Being, with this being said, um, let's move to the blitz part of this podcast, if you're ready for it. Let's go. So here we go, Josh. Do you have a pet? 
Yes, I have a dog. She is one and a half years old. Her name is Lexi. Weighs about 20 pounds. She's cute. Big distra distraction from swimming? Uh, no, not really. Small enough that I think it's helpful. Thank you. What is your average yardage for, for trading? Uh, well, this is going to vary a lot depending on what month you ask me in. Um, right about now, I'd say 6,000 ish that's that's sense. like average per session some are way above some are way below got it what is your personal preference long course meters short course meters or yards long course meters 100 percent. got it what is your favorite event to swim favorite event um the when I'm doing a better job at it than I did this ISL season, hundred fly short course is awesome. Um, yeah. When I, when I'm able to like really hit the underwaters and the perfect stroke count that gets me into the wall extended. Um, I have a really good time trying to figure out that race. It's interesting. It would be hundred butterfly for me also, but this is the first time you hear it. Um, yeah. I really like that race. Thank you. Um, Josh, um, what about your favorite event to spectate? To spectate? Ooh. Um, 200 IM is always fun. You got a lot of different strategy and lead changes. Same with 400 IM. Um, I mean, it really depends on who's swimming. You know, I, I don't think there's, a, there's really a swimming event that I dislike watching. I'm a pretty big fan of this sport. Fair enough. What was your favorite event to spectate in the ISL final? Um, I mean, okay, everyone's going to say skins, so I can't say skins. Um, let's see. I mean, I loved watching Selly win that 2 IM. Like, that, that was great. I mean, he pulls up on the lane line, just does a massive flex. Like, yeah, you got to love Selly that. style. It, it was like a throwback to, to Pac-12, 10 Cs. It was amazing. Yeah, I love that. Um, Josh, do you have a childhood idol? And if you did, who was it? Um, yeah. <laughs> Funny enough, uh, Lenny. Yeah, I had, I had a signed Lenny Kreselberg cap uh, on my bedroom wall from the time I was like six years old. Um, Crazy. Yeah, yeah, which is why I was very, very excited that, that he called me up and asked me to represent LA Current. Wow, thank you. Josh, what is your favorite sport to take part in outside of swimming? Um, I love playing soccer. Honestly, I wish we had more Europeans on our swim team again, because when I was like a freshman at Cal, um, our team was filled with like Italians and Estonians. Um, and we just all go to the park in Berkeley at the Marina and we'd have these big soccer games. Um, I'm horrible at soccer, but it's very fun. It's also um, quite dangerous soccer, especially for the knees. If you're getting intense with it, yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> What about your favorite sport to spectate? Um, American football, for American sure. Football. I, I love the NFL. I'm, I'm following all these trade rumors. Packers just re-signed Aaron Jones. Um, yeah, I, I love the NFL. Thank you, Josh. And last question for the Blitz. What was your college major? College major was physics. Physics. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this was Josh Pina for you. And Josh, before I let you go, do you have any final words for your fans and for the fans of LA Current? I got nothing else to go LA Current, follow us next year. Um, I think we did good, but yeah, we got we to get on the top of that podium. All right. So then before I let you go, I have another question for you. I don't feel satisfied. <laughs> okay. When okay. are you guys coming up with your signature sign? Yeah, I don't know. We got we got to come up with one that like doesn't look like a gang sign, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, we we might need to brainstorm this in the group chat. I feel like um, Maxime probably has some good ideas. I feel like there's a bunch of people on the Cal swim team that could help you out with this. Um, Shane Forker could be one. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll hit up Forker. Yeah. But anyway, um, ladies and gentlemen, once again, Josh Pina for you. Josh, thank you so much for making it to this podcast. Yeah, thanks, man. Good to talk. And for everyone watching, our next podcast will take place this upcoming Friday. And after this, we'll have a break until next Wednesday. Um, please tune in and 
Thank you so much for being with us.